webinar. Hello, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is a uh, live with Nassim. However, uh, Nassim is going to be joining us in about an hour. Um, he's uh, wrapped up in some, some physics and uh, engineering some free energy devices and uh, over unity <laughs> uh, energy propulsion. Um, so, you know, he's got some important work that he's uh, focused on right now, but um, he's going to be joining us and uh, we're going to have that awesome opportunity to get to uh, ask him questions uh, and uh, kind of explore his vast reservoir of knowledge and get to see the universe from his unique perspective that really, I think, uh, gives us just uh, some, some wonderful insight into a better understanding the universe and our place within it. Uh, we also have with us uh, Inez, um, part of the uh, uh, Residence Academy faculty. Uh, so me and Inez will be um, taking some questions in the interim. Uh, so if you, um, you can uh, feel free to uh, post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, you can go ahead and post your questions for Nassim, he'll be on. Um, and as well, if you have any questions uh, for me and Inez, we'll be happy to open up a discussion on uh, anything you want to explore. Um, a couple of things. Uh, so on the, uh, for those joining us via Zoom on the, uh, on, on the Zoom webinar, on the chat, um, if you can change your settings to all panelists and attendees. Um, so the default is all panelists. And so when you enter in a, a comment saying hi um, or whatever it might be, uh, it, under the default, it only goes to us, the panelists. Uh, but if you can change it to all panelists and attendees, everybody can see the dialogue there. Uh, and as I said, uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A section. And the Q&A, it has a, a voting uh, function on it so that uh, you can give a question that you see, if you like it, you can give it a thumbs up and that will bring the question to the top of the list. And it also helps us to field what questions are um, people are most wanting to explore and discuss uh, in this particular session. Uh, so uh, with that, um, do you want to... Uh, give any update on what you've been up to, Inez, or say yeah. hello? Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi, William. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so, well, uh, first of all, as I guess most of you are already aware, there's Model 7 coming out. So that's one thing that's getting um, already finished. It's, it's been launched very soon, like next, next month, very probably first, second week. So where that's like about the most exciting news I have for the moment. Also starting module eight, which is basically um, the paper uh, that uh, has been working uh, Nassim and Olivia since uh, a year or a little bit more of that, which is amazing that we all, all, you, William and I had the opportunity to have a brief downloading at first, which was amazing. Um, then uh, also as well, I'm about to publish an article, it's a paper about the electron review. It's, an, it's a review of an electron, of the, of the electron, of the models, semi-classical models of the electron. So that's all, also finished already. I'm about just finishing the last details. And this is very exciting for me because this is something that is really connected to what it's going to be launched in model eight. It's really connected to the paper that's going to, that's coming out soon as well, um, and it's very um, gratifying for me also as well uh, because of that subject. I have met many physicists in the mainstream approach, let's say, that are really, really um, how would I say that uh, unhappy with the state of physics at the moment. So for me, it was quite a surprise to know that we were not alone; that it is a, a big community of people that are kind of not convinced of the Copenhagen interpretation and all of that weirdness about quantum physics. And so, so these are approaches to the electron that are very close, very close to the holographic solution. So it was amazing for me to realize that there were many people thinking on the same uh, subject, um, approaching it in a very uh, similar perspective, although they didn't totally 
uh, let's say, since the holographic solution is something that is not completely um, understood and taken by the mainstream approach, then you lose the, basically the, the main part of the model. So these all these models get very close, but because they miss that the small link, then it gets almost there, but not exactly there. So at the end, it was beautiful for me to collect all this all these visions uh, in a very, let's say, organic way, because they go, they thrive from one model to the other and ending with the holographic solution for the electron, which is uh, Amir Malbaker's and Nassim Sarain uh, work. And that was uh, that was amazing. So so yeah, and I even, even got to, to well to develop it a little bit further um, these calculations. And so it's amazing. So on that side, well, I'm very happy. Electron paper, uh, model seven, model eight, and um, whoa, and Shintergy experiments as well here in Mexico. So <laughs> so yeah, I'm 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 busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, for, for those who, who might not know, uh, the Shintergy experiments are uh, a series of experiments that Inez and her research team have been doing, uh, looking at the effects of consciousness on physical systems. So a way to measure uh, conscious activity at a distance um, in, uh, you know, an objective measurement way. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, influence on uh, physical systems, in this case, uh, light emission by a laser and uh, detection or reception of that photo emission. Um, you know, they, they have a, a very experienced uh, meditator, uh, somebody who's got 20 years of practice in the specialized, uh, I, I believe it's a Dogchen um, Buddhist type yeah. meditation. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he's able to go into a meditative state and you can see a change in the photon flux, the, the reception of uh, uh, photons uh, by the, the detector. Yeah, exactly that. It, yeah, it is, it is amazing. His name is Jose Luis Bueno. He's like, he's the, the, the leader of re this part of the research. The Shintergy project is his project because that's the training he developed on his own because of the training he had already because, uh, with all this suction, exactly suction tradition and the, the monks. So that it's called linaje in Spanish. I don't know how that word would be in English. Like the tradition of all the monks that follow the same path and that re reincarnate and follow the same, the same teaching. So uh, that was fascinating. And so, yeah, we have very interesting results, some of which we uh, partially reproduced in Taurus Tech as well. And uh, so, well, th that's also part of, the, of, uh, of many of the things that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, those, those were some interesting results here. So um, we, we have a, a very isolated detection set up here. So we've got um, one of the most robust Faraday cages that could be constructed. It's our, our uh, advanced physics isolation chamber. Uh, so, you know, Faraday cage, it um, blocks out all ambient uh, electromagnetic fields. Yeah. Um, and we have a extremely precise photo detector. It's a photomultiplier tube, so it can detect one photon uh, every millisecond or even at sh a shorter time interval. So it's an extremely uh, sensitive uh, photo detector system and a stabilized light source, it's a laser that emits a very specific amount of photons per unit time. Uh, and we did some of these experiments with Jose uh, Luis and um, it, it was very interesting. Uh, some of the results we saw, one of the things that was very interesting to me even from a, a biology perspective is that oftentimes uh, having the person in the room would increase the photon count on the photo detector. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, a very uh, interesting effect that, um, you know, kind of raising questions, is this related to biophoton emission, photons being emitted by the body, uh, mm -hmm. or the energetic aspects of the body uh, increasing electromagnetic field activity around the photo detector? Uh, some very interesting results with very the uh, research we did. Yeah, that, that was very interesting. And it also raises the question because in principle, the detector shouldn't detect, I mean, the emitter shouldn't, yeah, it shouldn't detect uh, uh, photons that are thermal photons mm -hmm. because it's not mm -hmm. in their 
in its uh, degree of, of detection. So yeah, we still have many things to, to further explore. Uh, for the time being, um, this is um, part of, of the project. And um, so, yeah, so basically very exciting. And uh, also we are um, trying to, to figure out um, the, the bio bio biology part of it. I mean, like, let's say that would be like with you and um, Nassim and all that, all the group together, like to figure out how we could uh, ensemble this uh, experiment with the model, the theoretical model of, um, of the paper that's, that's about to come and also with the biological part as well, which will be very interesting. Uh, and uh, so in, in the electron review paper uh, that you just uh, did, uh, you were looking at the uh, phenomenon of uh, zwitter bewegung Yes, uh, yes, Zwitter-Bewegung. Uh -huh. You know, it's really amazing because, I mean, me coming from the, from, uh, let's say, the standard approach and, uh, and at, at the atomic and molecular level, Theater Bewegung was something that I had was not aware of. When I first started uh, working for the for, for this um, uh, review, I was like, you know, when you start, you just look around and see how many things you can explore. This Theater Bewegung captured my attention since the beginning because I said, oh, oh wait, wait a minute. Theater Bewegung for the people, because that's a word, German word, means trembling along the way, electron motion. And this is something that Dirac, well, not Direct, direct derived the, the equations for the electron in the um, in the frame of the relativity uh, scheme, but then Schrödinger, when he was analyzing the the solutions for this equation, he found that there was this oscillating at the speed of light phenomena in the electron, and so this created a huge you know what's this? It's not possible because the, the electron has a mass and so it cannot be moving at this. Speed because then what happens with this match, you know, and, and there was all this discussion going on. So the solution that they found was to say that the Sitter-Ruin was a relativistic effect that uh, uh, happened in the relativistic regime, meaning by that at the speeds which are uh, uh, approximately the speed of light, and that it was due to the interference between the positive and negative states of the Dirac C. So that's the way, you know, this positron electron uh, dynamics, it's something that they use very often to say, okay, we're not exactly violating any law. We're not because it's happening so fast that you would seemingly not violate any, any uh, conservation law. So, so that was the main explanation for it. But, but, you know, because we work in the holographic solution and we have a classical um, solution for it, this was not like, well, as... When I saw this interpretation, I said, no, 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 this is, and this is when I found these other authors that were claiming as well as me that this could not be, um, I mean, because they use Cedar-Bewegan to explain the spin of the electron. But as you know, spin is only accounted for in the quantum regime. It's supposed, supposed to, to be something that's only happening um, it's not a, like a classical effect. It's not something that you would say this electron is really spinning. And this is a huge debate because the, under these approaches that I have uh, studied and that we have developed ourselves, it is a real precession of the electron. It is a real movement. Yeah. And it's and so many people have been working on it. Richard Gauthier, uh, jean louis Van Bell, I mean, um, Hestenis, David Hestenis at Arizona State University. And so all these people, we have like created this kind of group of, of um, discussion team where well all of this is being debated and um, and so yeah I, Oliver Consa, uh, Giorgio Vasallo I mean it's a beautiful beautiful group of people Alexander Borinsky and they all bring something different to the to the puzzle so it's it's amazing and the Syrup Wigan so so it seems that yeah it is a real a phenomena, a real, and, and, it, and it would explain this, uh, of, of course, the spin of the electron. So yeah, that's, and it's really related to, to the solution that, um, to, a, to a different perspective of, of the holographic solution. You will see when the paper comes out that the interpretation that we have given to the holographic solution is, um, is very, it's it, on the thermodynamics uh, perspective, information theory perspective is also very related to another, a different perspective, which connects all scales. And well, that is eventually that spin, but why is it the spin? So it's, it's beautiful. Sir Wigan. <laughs> it's kind of it, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, whenever uh, 
the mainstream physicists kind of run into a problem. Uh, oftentimes the solution is to invoke the uh, quantum vacuum. Uh, you, you know, so it's like Zwitter uh, Weyvergung's uh, interaction with the uh, positrons and electrons of the Dirac C, um, even with the, the Higgs mechanism, which only accounts for 2% of the mass of the nucleons, the other 98% of the mass are gluons and, uh, 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 gluons, um, and uh, quarks and anti-quarks fluctuating in the qu quantum vacuum, and yeah. e even the uh, electric charge of the uh, electron. So uh, the bare electric charge of the pro uh, electron under the standard model is infinite. It has an infinite electric charge. And to solve that, you just envelop it in these layers and layers of uh, electron positron vacuum okay. pairs of the quantum vacuum and shield out all of that infinity except for negative one <laughs> <laughs> unit. <laughs> you know? uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting that uh, oftentimes the quantum vacuum comes into the rescue, uh, but it, it just seems, got, like, seems to me like maybe we should start with the quantum vacuum and work out and not just, you know, pull it in whenever uh, there's an anomalous situation that uh, can't be yeah. explained using the standard model. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, that's exactly that. And, and also the fact that how come I never heard of that before? You know, okay, I was not no. working at that regime. I, I, I usually don't work in the relativistic regime, but nevertheless, you know, zero wiggle, and that was the first time, something so important, that was the first time I heard that word, you know, like, so, so I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. What they do with this, I mean, so we have also this tendency, you know, to just like look on the other direction when there's something we don't totally understand. And well, Okay, I understand that it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure also as well in the mainstream physics and you have to, you know, keep on with publications and articles. So maybe you don't have the time to really think about things. This is like um, the privilege that only a few physicists can have, you know, because most of the time you're giving courses, uh, thesis and PhDs and, 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 and so we don't have the time really to really think it through like deeply 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 so so only for the very privileged ones that could even have 10 years with no publications because they are considered you know like geniuses these are the ones that are allowed to have that so so that's a feedback loop which is really um margin that marginalizes many of the physicists in the in, in the in the medium because then you know you you, you, you get like marginalized but well anyway so so that was the thing um so yeah very interesting and i just can't wait for the paper to be out you know <laughs> so, they, so all of these can be true finally you know solved it's finally solved and when the sense comes in he will probably talk a lot about it and and uh, well yeah so that's yeah, de definitely looking forward to uh, seeing that paper do, do you have any idea when uh, that might get released it was supposed to be like in two months, but I don't know. It's uh -huh. like, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, the thing is, each time you advance a little further, you see the connections going in many other directions. And so you say, Jesus Christ, this is like a never ending fractal. So that's exactly what's happening. Oh, la, la, la. And so the further you go, the less resistance you will have to be accepted. You know, if it's explaining this and that, and also that, and then it goes further to explain that as well. And backwards and forwards and in any direction up, up and down in any scale then so it's like i i uh, i can imagine it's like wow wow oh, wow yeah it's it's not easy to deal with that kind of information so yeah um yeah 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 that that would be the thing and it's curiously enough I, there's a question that was related to what we were just discussing so maybe i could address it right away yeah because yeah, because this is Richard Harrenburg. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you to, to take that question. Yeah, <laughs> you know because uh, I, I was just looking, you know, in the the uh, quantum gravity and the holographic mass paper, uh, it, it says um, Frank Wilczek posed this question. Um, we see that the question it poses is not why is gravity so feeble, feeble, but whether why is the proton's mass so small? For a natural Planck units, the strength of gravity simply is what it is, a primary quantity, while the proton's mass is this tiny number. 
Uh, so, so Richard uh, Herrenberg is asking, how can I explain that the Planck mass is much greater than the proton mass? Uh, can I use a photon with the Planck radius and frequency uh, to explain it? Yeah. Yeah, you, you could do that. But the thing is, because we have to keep in mind, and this is something directly related with the hierarchy problem that happens in physics. So the hierarchy problem is exactly this. How can we have a mass, such a big mass in such a small particle? Because, you know, if we dealt with the Planck as it was a particle, which is what we do in the, in the holographic uh, model, that's the main difference. We take the, the Planck spherical unit. It is a particle, a real particle of the space of space. So meanwhile, it is taken as a unit in mainstream physics. The Planck, it's the Planck unit. It's like the, the smallest uh, distance you could measure. And so uh, which is pertinent to the size of, the, of our universe. So that's a main difference. So here the thing is that when you approach, when you see the solution for the electron mass, which is a beautiful, um, a beautiful model. It, it it makes you understand that what we're talking about is is angular velocity relationships between the Planck, the proton, and the electron. So at the at the core, you have the singularity, which is at, at the si the size of a say the size of the Planck scale, and at the set at the size you have <coughs> you have this vorticity, right? And so, as you know, and this is some work that Alexander Borinsky has proposed as well, spin is, uh, is also curving space-time. It is the main, um, the main ingredient for the curvature of space-time. So even though you think that you have particles, so atomic particles that are very, high, um, very light in mass, what's happening in reality is that they have a very high spin, a very huge spin. So that spin is also curving space-time. This is another way of looking at it. So when you have the, the, so you know the proton is composed of planks, right? Of these planks. And so these planks are, so, um, and they're coherently spinning, like in this vorticity. So you have the, at the Planck scale, you have this vorticity, which is at its maximum, right? And it starts to decay as long as you move away from the center of the vorticity, like, uh, like the center of the hurricane. So that's what's happening. If you, if you realize that the, the mass is, is related to this, um, strength of the vorticity, let's put it that way, as when you're moving away from it, your mass is decreasing because the speed is, decre is decreasing as well. And this is, thing, this is seen in the other sense as the, um, as the mass dilation, which is taking this the other way around. In relativity, you usually say it backwards. You say, as you approach the speed of light, the mass increases, right? This is another way of saying that. So you could approach to the to this speed, or you can go away from this speed. If you go away from this speed, it is not a mass dilation, but a mass contraction. It's 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 getting heavier, and if, if you uh, uh, lighter, and if you go mass dilation, the term mass dilation you have to be very careful. If you're referring to when to what direction are you heading to? If it's going to the speed of light or going away from the speed of light. So if you go to the speed of light, you're uh, increasing your mass. Your, the vorticity, okay? Remember that uh, the gravity is also a measure of the vorticity. It is the measure of the vorticity and the vorticity is also the spin. So when this, um, uh, so when these particles, these particles, exactly what they are, is that they are particular conditions in this dynamics of the spin, of the spin of the vacuum. So they're happening at particular ratios. So the proton is happening in a particular ratio. The electron is happening in a further particular ratio with respect to the proton. And so this is the natural way of understanding the hierarchy problem. The hierarchy problem is just following that line, that line of, of angular velocity relationships. So this, is the, this, would, this would be like the most um, comprehensible way of understanding the, this issue of the of the difference between masses and um, and size and, uh, and and all of that. So, so of course, as you spin faster, the com the, the mass is compacted further. This is another way of, of so it's denser, so it's more massive. Let's say. So that's the thing. Um, that's the, that's the way I would I would approach this this problem. Of course, when the model seven uh, com, comes out, you will see this in detail how this re velocity relationship happens, how the electron is explained under this perspective, and you will also see why the Planck is also concerned. 
a white mass is, is higher and why for the why the let's say the in the hierarchy problem the the mass of the of the proton uh, with respect to electron is also explained and the and the mass of the electron with respect to the proton so you will see that there's a hierarchy which is very natural which is not understandable from the standard quantum mechanical approach and relativistic approach but from the perspective of the holographic model it is completely it comes naturally from from the model and um can, yeah. can, so can i use a photon with a Planck radius and frequency uh to explain it um it, it really does come down to uh the, the spin and that that relativistic mass dilation yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. exactly so uh, usually when the person is uh in the our audience we you, we kind of pop them out for the question so but i don't know if this is something that jamie would have to do so i don't know if richard was present but um in any way um because sometimes they they they, they have they have access and they ask the question directly so if they have any question for the question we would address it like that but in this case i don't know so let's let's maybe move further to us to, 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 to another question yeah, um, I don't know uh, if we can bring people on uh, well, during this session. Um, uh, may maybe if uh, Jamie does have that capability, he can start bringing the folks on when we uh, uh, answer their questions. I might um, be able to. Who, whose question is it? This was from uh, Richard Herrenberg. Okay, one sec. Okay, Richard, if you want to go um, with your video, you can, or you can keep your video off, but you should be able to talk. You're a panelist. You'll need to uh, unmute yourself, Richard. There he is. Hey, Richard. Great. Hi. <laughs> uh, great answer. Now, I'll give you the background to this question. Two weeks ago, M asked William a similar question about the 10 to the 60th Planck's and a proton. And, and M thought that he understood the answer about density, how, how to go from the Planck to the proton. So last week I asked him what he understood and he wasn't able to explain it very well. So he says, we'll have to ask William. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, the group said, well, I should ask Nassim next week. Mm -hmm. So I tried to figure out an easy way and I tried to figure the answer myself. So here's the answer that I came up with. Mm -hmm. And you can tell me whether this makes sense. I tried to find a simple answer and it starts with light and the Planck frequency, which is the highest possible frequency. And the Planck <laughs> particle is vibrating at this enormous frequency, which is an enormous amount of energy. And in fact, if you convert that energy to mass, I think it's like 750 kilograms or some huge number. And that's another strange question. How could that be? <laughs> oh, um, the, the, the Planck energy, uh, if you convert it to mass, it's 10 to the negative five grams. Yeah. Oh, well, here's, okay. I, uh, what I did is I took the Planck frequency and used E uh, equals e HF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, oh, so the general idea that was amazing mm -hmm. to me was how can it be that as the photon gets larger and larger, it has less energy. The wavelength gets longer, it has less energy, e equals HF. Mm -hmm. And 
when it gets shorter, like a Planck, it has this enormous amount of energy. And so I was able to calculate that for a proton and so on. And so it made sense that yes, the, the photon energy for a proton, if you considered a proton as a photon of uh, the, fo the proton radius being the wavelength of the photon, mm -hmm. you, you can explain, well, yes, the mass would go down considerably uh, because the energy goes down. So then mm -hmm. I said, well, I wonder if that same ratio works for mass, that the mass would decrease the same way as the photon energy decreases. And that seems to be the case. That's yeah. sort of explained it to me. Yeah, it is. It, it is an, another way of looking at it. And I'm sure I took some shortcuts in trying to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> but it it uh, intuitively it makes it much easier to understand for me. Oh, now I'll give you one more part of the story. I came to this idea because I was trying to figure out what the vacuum looked like. And it seemed like it couldn't be filled with plonks side to side because that then that would be one huge proton for the whole universe. So that I couldn't explain that. I said, well, the universe is really filled with light. The vacuum is really filled with light. And that light is similar to the Planck photon at the Planck frequency. It's gamma ray light, extremely high energy. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, it probably is filled with photons of multiples of the Planck uh, photon. So remember, that's the smallest possible photon. Mm -hmm. So there's probably light of two Planck lengths, radius of two Planck lengths and three Planck lengths and four Planck lengths, which is frequency of one half, one third, one quarter, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that the vacuum must be filled with all these little photons of all different sizes. And that seemed to make sense to me. And then Inez was talking about uh, how uh, the virtual particle idea is used. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time I said, well, a photon is an electron or an electron is a photon and people say that yes a photon converts itself into an electron and a positron the photon only lives for one little flash let's say one Planck second and then that flash creates an electron and a proton but they only exist for maybe a few Planck seconds but they have mass interestingly. So we went from no mass or from the Planck mass. I, or, well, no, let's not confuse Planck. We went from a photon with no mass. And, and then all of a sudden we had some mass, uh, electron and a positron. And then we go back, they combine, and there's another photon. And actually they say it's, um, it's two photons that produce an electron and a positron, and then that reaction produces two photons again. So that helped give me the idea that the, the vacuum was filled with photons. And then one other thought was that mm -hmm. the Planck and the proton are black holes. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, how come we can't see all this light, even though it's in a different part of the spectrum where you can't see it, it's gamma rays but you would certainly sense it. And the answer seems to be, first of all, it's contained within the black holes, doesn't mm -hmm. get out. 
And second of all, uh, as this little reaction goes from the short flash of the photon to an electron and a positron, uh, and then back to a photon again, that those photons are immediately absorbed by the electron positron. There's no photons to escape for us to see. Yes. And that's why we don't see them. So those are some of my ideas and I'm looking for where I made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, but it's been a very interesting uh, experiment, thought experiment to try to figure this out. Now, I, now I'll let you talk. Sorry, sorry for talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 on the contrary, it was amazing. I'm curious about your background. You have a very deep intuition of, of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of it. Oh, well, that's an interesting story. Now, I'll give you the real short story. When I went to college, I ended up going to a very small college. This one is in the 1960s. And we had just had Sputnik and all that. So there was a big push for science. And the college I went to had only 1,000 students. But because of the push for science, they had four PhD physics professors. <laughs> and this was a liberal arts college. So this was very unusual. There weren't many students taking physics. There were four. <laughs> 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 Only four physics majors. And I was one. And I didn't realize that I should have gotten a PhD for my undergraduate degree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how good it was until later when I went to other schools. And, and, and then finally some advisor said, well, you should have at least gone for a master's or a PhD program instead of getting more background in other areas. So uh, anyway, that's the quick story. Now, uh, Amazing. Uh, I've been very fortunate to get a tremendous education with my career uh, in all kinds of different areas, in engineering, electrical engineering, communications, and, and physics. So oh. that's, that's the quick story. Amazing. It's, it's amazing because it, it, it's, it's, uh, most of what you said, it's, it's correct. Um, it's, you can think about this Planck spherical unit as um, electromagnetic fluctuations, which is basically photons, no? So the thing is that when they organize co coherently, that's when mass happens, okay? So that's the thing. Uh, also as well, when you have um, creation and annihilation of, of uh, photons, this, the dynamics of the electron position and the photons is, as you say, too fast for it to happen, uh, to be observed from the from from our perspective, from our time scale. So that's uh, as well correct. Uh, basically, all all of what you said was correct. Um, uh, what would I, I? I was I I kept something, but I because I asked you this other question. Now I lost it. <laughs> what I had on my mind. You know, yeah. um, I, I would uh, add one thing to it. Uh, so uh, when you were trying to. Imagine the ordering of the Planck spherical units in space. Um, I, I think that uh, you came to a, a valid conclusion there um, that uh, if they were all ordered, uh, say how we uh, imagine them in the proton, then everything would be a proton. Uh, one of the, the key pieces to this though that you, you might not have yet come across is that uh, so those Planck spherical units, we have to think of it as a, a Planck plasma. And so what, what that means is that, so, um, you know, it, it, indeed the, the, the ultimate source of these Planck spherical units are that they are um, uh, quantum harmonic electromagnetic oscillators. Um, now, uh, via certain geometries of space-time, the, these photons uh, can get a dipole moment just like the electron, just like the proton. Um, so the Planck spherical units, these PSUs, they have a uh, dipole moment. Now, uh, 
in most of the circumstance, the alignment of those dipole moments of this Planck plasma is, I'm going to say, uh, chaotic. And that um, there is, it's actually symmetrical. Uh, so um, they, they have a, a symmetrical orientation of the dipole moments. And what that means is that uh, they're all pointing in different, every possible direction. Uh, so, yeah, so it sums to zero, essentially. That is the orientation, that, that, that's the ordering of the Planck plasma that comprises most of space. Um, now, uh, th in particle physics, the statistics for that, it's called a, a, a Fermi gas, a, a Fermi state. Um, now, uh, there's the, the Fermi statistics, but then there's the Bose, Einstein statistics, the Bose statistics. Uh, so what you have is that you can have symmetry breaking where that symmetrical orientation of all those BSUs can be broken and you get an asymmetry, which basically means that all those dipole moments align. Now, when that happens, you have this transition, a phase transition from a Fermi gas to a Bose state, a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, that transition, that is what we call matter. That's where you get mass. Uh, is you, you, uh, th those are the particles in this Planck plasma uh, sea of energy. Uh, it's where you have a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, and if you go out to the boundary, what you can think of like as the um, surface horizon of the black hole, uh, this Bose-Einstein condensate, um, you have this uh, Fermi-Bose mixture. Uh, so you're, you're starting to get, uh, you've got a transition point uh, at the, this boundary condition at the surface horizon. Uh, and, and that's where you see things like uh, mass and the electromagnetic field. So that, that's where you see uh, actual like light that's there, right? Because um, it's all light. How come we don't see light everywhere? It, it's at those uh, boundary conditions. Um, and that's also, uh, you know, where you get mass and um, electromagnetism. Thank you. Um, that re did remind me that, yes, this uh, virtual particle thing with the flash of the of the Planck photon and, and the electron and positron is a plasma. So in theory, the, the vacuum would be glowing like a plasma, except at gamma ray frequencies. And I, did, I have not done the calculations to figure out what all this implies. So, yeah. so, well, well, so. well, you know, you, you can see the glow of the vacuum. It's called a UNRU radiation. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, so uh, you, you basically, like, you have to create an event horizon. Uh, to see the glow of the quantum vacuum. Uh, and, and there's two ways to do that in, in relativity. Uh, if you approach relativistic speeds, you create a event horizon uh, behind you. And so you'll actually see photons emitting from the vacuum ahead of you. And then there's also uh, UNRU uh, Hawking radiation around a, a black hole. So, so the, you can actually see the the... the photons or light emission that is occurring in the vacuum uh, under certain states. Great. Well, I figured some ought to leak out. And so that would be an interesting question. Yes. Now, uh, you asked uh, my education. Uh, my secret is that I go to Google and I put in the words like quantum vacuum or something like that. And then I, there's always millions of answers. And I look at the pictures and I look through the pictures and pick out the ones that seem to make sense to me and maybe read the article that goes with the pictures. And then lately I discovered that there are YouTube videos, some of which are pretty good that ex try to explain some of these things. And, and so I take a look at those and uh, 
what I've learned is really a compilation of what I've learned from a resonance science academy <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and Google. And uh, certainly uh, some places have been uh, better references than others. And I've, I've, uh, those have become my favorites. So that's, that's the quick story. Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Richard, for your question. Well, thank you for your answers. <laughs> Great question. And, and, you know, it kind of is uh, along the lines of another one here from uh, Simon K3. We might have already just uh, addressed this entire yeah. question, but uh, okay. it was asked, uh, are we made of protons or planks? Or are they considered the same for you, i.e. Mm -hmm. Planck's as photons or PSUs? Um, if so, how would you distinguish the scaling for the 99.9999% space light that we as human beings uh, truly are? Really quick, who was that again, William? Uh, that was uh, Simon K3. Okay, uh, thanks. Th th they might want to uh, add to that question in light of what we just discussed, kind of you know, <laughs> elucidating the, the difference between the Planck spherical unit and the proton, um, but you, you know how the proton is Planck spherical units just in a different uh, state, basically in a quantum coherence state, a Bose-Einstein condensate. And, and so- um, Again? Uh, uh, Simon K3, S-I-M-O-N K3. Huh, I am not seeing. Oh, maybe, they may not. Uh, they may not be here still. They, they might have got their answer and left. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but oh, you, you know, it, I would just say I, I don't know what you you will uh, might want to add to this, Inez, but yeah. just that f fundamentally everything is made of this Planck plasma, the the Planck spherical units, um, and, and the geometry of space time and how that um, uh, energy resonance and harmonics uh, uh, creates the, these uh, wave patterns in that field. Um, so, you know, ultimately, fundamentally, we're made of that, that, that Planck substructure of space, but that's what makes protons. And so we're also made of the protons that are made of that uh, substructure of space. Yeah. You guys want to choose another one uh, before Nassim comes in? Sure. Uh, ha have you been able to see uh, any questions uh, you might want to field, Ines? I was just going around them, so. Um... Thank you, Richard. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. move along to the next folks. I appreciate your right, thank extensive you. Thank you. knowledge. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, Wow, okay. Um, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, because uh, you know, I see some questions like, uh, what, what do you think is the most important step for us to attain free energy vehicles and devices? And uh, <laughs> so certainly, I, I have some opinions on this, but oh, it's, go, go, it, come on, really, go ahead. <laughs> I'll it's, follow it, your lead. <laughs> it, 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 it's nowhere near the insight that uh, we're going to get from Nassim. <laughs> yeah, so. But we can start, we can start. Yeah, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll start, in. maybe he can come in and, and correct yeah. us where we've awesome. Yeah, that's great, right. let's, let's go ahead, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, kind of somewhat obviously, but still I think it needs to be stated clearly. The, the first step is understanding that we live in a sea of energy, uh, that, that the universe is permeated by a field of energy. Um, and although to our naked eyes and even to many of our measurement apparatus that we've been able to construct thus far, although it might appear to those rather rudimentary instruments that uh, space has a very low energy level, um, we know from more sophisticated measurements of the structure and mechanics of the universe that uh, there is an extremely high energy density 
uh, to this sea of energy, this energy that permeates uh, all things. And, you know, from a, a kind of theoretical perspective, uh, I can't believe you would come to any other conclusion when you look around and you see quasars, galaxies, stars, planets, living things. Uh, there's obviously a lot of energy in the system. That energy uh, came from somewhere. Um, and so uh, understanding that um, not, not only is there an extremely high energy density to what we perceive as the most empty unit of space, uh, but even more than that, uh, that this um, energy is connected in a multi-fractal, holofractal, multiverse system. So there is nearly limitless energy to draw from. Um, so that is the first realization of free energy. The idea that uh, energy in the universe truly is limitless. Uh, it's it's uh, absolutely abundant. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that um, you need to perhaps disrupt a system to obtain energy um, isn't necessarily the case. Um, in fact, in most instances, the way that the universe obtains and utilizes this vast amount of free energy is in a process of creation that increases the uh, overall coherence, harmony, the, the synergistic organization of the universe. And that's really the technology that we're looking to achieve. Uh, it's really um, fundamentally, how does uh, the universe um, obtain energy? Uh, that, that's how we want to do it. Um, and, and that's, uh, I believe, how it's going to be accomplished um, is really um, replicating some of the natural systems uh, that already have this uh, harmonic energy exchange with that um, vacuum energy, that, that uh, energy that, that permeates all of space. Um, and uh, so th that, that's kind of like a re real general perspective on it. That's kind of setting up the framework. You know, we need that framework to be adopted by more than just <laughs> a few scientists, you know, you know I mean, not, not only is that going to get science out of a lot of the challenges it's gotten itself into, but it's going to enable the next generation of technology, which is things like uh, gravitational control. So, so the ability uh, to engineer the uh, uh, structure of space in order to control gravitational fields. Um, that, you know, that's, that's going to be a huge part of uh, getting this kind of uh, free energy and um, novel propulsion uh, mechanisms. Uh, and so more specifically, I think that one of the first steps in doing that is uh, there has to be the creation of a boundary condition uh, in space. Uh, so one of the issues is you have this nearly infinite energy density. Let, let's just say it's an extremely high energy density in free space. Um, but because it's in this Fermi state, this symmetrical state, uh, it's not available to do work, mostly, because um, it, it all evens out. It's kind of like thermodynamic equilibrium. So what you need is a way to introduce uh, thermal disequilibrium, a boundary condition uh, that pushes it out of that symmetry. So a symmetry breaking asymmetry. Um, and in that way, you can uh, use it to do work. Uh, but the mechanism in which you use to create that boundary condition, that asymmetry, um, it has to be established in such a way that the energy that is drawn, a certain amount of it feeds back to sustain the boundary condition. And that's a free energy device. Um, one of the simplest ways to do this, the way that nature does it, is via spin. Uh, so you've got this, this Planck plasma that's a, a Fermi state 
with all the uh, PSQ dipole moments pointing every which way in this overall symmetrical net zero configuration, uh, if the moment that you introduce spin, uh, th this is actually like a fluid dynamic property. Uh, it's a, a rheological property. The moment you introduce spin, uh, those dipole moments will begin to align. And that's the symmetry breaking. Um, that is the introduction of coherence and uh, you know, shifting to a Bose state, Bose-Einstein condensate, that produces the uh, boundary condition. Uh, and, and now you can begin to extract energy from the vacuum. Uh, and just in time, we have Nassim here to, to, <laughs> to clarify or, or uh, resolve all the things That's I just awesome. said. <laughs> That sounded really good. It was okay. Okay, uh, I was like, "Wow, who's that scientist?" I, I, I've been I've been listening to what you've been saying, so I'm, I'm... <laughs> nice, right on. Uh, I'm sorry to everyone for not being uh, available in the last few weeks, um, and uh, and coming on late today. It's been epic time. Please be patient with me, everybody. I'm doing my best to keep up with everything. And, um, and actually, you know, and um, it will be worth it. I swear it'll be worth it. Uh, uh, it's a little suffering right now, but uh, when I'm done with what I'm doing, then it, I think you're all gonna really like what comes out of it. So I'm pretty excited. So you guys been answering questions? Yeah, yeah, we um, had a, a couple of really good questions we started out with. Um, there was a question on the hierarchy problem um, oh. and, and as was able to, uh, I think, explain that in depth, uh, you know, just so, so, you know, why is it that the PSU mass is 10 to the negative five grams and the proton mass is, what, what is it, 10 to the negative 23 grams? So, so you know, there's this, you know, huge disparity. Uh, disparity between those two masses. Right. Um, so we were able to uh, explain that some, and then also um, how it is that the, the uh, configuration of the PSUs can give rise to empty space in one hand, but then also uh, structure mass um, and, and the, the the proton in, in another state, you know, so kind of introducing the idea that uh, uh, Planck plasma. Right, great. And, and the part of a fermionic versus bosonic and how it is happening in the space transition between the two and all of that was amazing. It was amazing. Right on, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really important that, you know, what you guys are discussing right now is stuff that, um, ha you know, most physicists that are doing advanced research in unification or is thinking about advanced concepts of physics, like fundamental concepts of physics, not just like, you know, the stuff on top, but like people that are working on understanding entropy, understanding, you know, uh, parity and, and uh, symmetry in physics and all this. These are the things that they struggle with. And what you guys are talking about is the resolution of all of these problems, um, you know, in a really simple, beautiful, fluid dynamics, mechanical way that is <laughs> fractal in nature and so on. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And you know that this disparity between the mass of the Planck and the mass of the proton, or, and yeah, the mass of the proton, uh, you know, this hierarchy problem, um, you know, because I mean, clearly, if the Planck's had a 10 to the minus five grams mass, if they have a 10 to the minus five grams mass, uh, why is it we don't see the gravitational effect of that? I mean, it's like the, you know, the universe <laughs> should shrink into a, like the size of a basketball, right? So, um, you, you know, because there's a lot of those little guys, so that is a lot of mass. And that's that, that, you know, if you were to look at the base of that issue, 
um, the base of that issue is the distinction between um, between gravitational mass and inertial mass. And um, and the the relationship of the two, you you could think of it in a different way. You could think of it the difference between rest mass and um, black hole mass, right? The Schwarzschild condition of a system. So because the Planck pixel is described only theoretically, meaning it it emerges from you know quantum theory from the fundamental physics that we observe but we don't measure its mass directly meaning we know its mass is that because it it it's you know everywhere in our equation so we know it gives the right answer in all this but um but if we would measure but so we could think of the planck uh, mass as the black hole mass of that object, right? Where the black hole mass of a proton would be 10 to the 14, right? So it'd be, you know, a huge mass, right? So it would be, there wouldn't be a hierarchy problem, right? It would, the proton being much, much larger than the Planck would have a much, much larger mass, right? That's not the case. Why? Is because there is screening. You can think of it as Poisson screening. And it, this is a concept that's already in quantum theory, but it's not understood well, meaning they use it, right? With the Klein-Gordon equation and all this. But basically, you know, the, it's not all the energy of a system. When we say mass, we can convert to energy, right? It's not all the energy of the system that's expressed on its horizon. Most of it is screened from the horizon, most of it. So you can think of it like you have a coherent crystal, right? And, and because it's spinning, right? But like, but the interface between that crystal that's spinning and the, and, and the exterior is Fermi. So it's, it's messy. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a lot of random fluctuation of like the little plungs going everywhere. And that screens the, you know, the energy that's present. So you get a black hole in the middle, but you don't know, right? Because it's screened. And so the, 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 the measurement, the gravitational effect you're measuring is the screened mass. Right. And 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 so that there's there's and this is what's missing in quantum theory. This might sound really crazy, especially if you're a physicist. You might not be able to follow what I'm telling you. You will when we publish this next paper because it's crystal clear. It gives all the right answers, all the right constants. I mean, all the constants, all the all the conservation law becomes unified, you know, all the scales. I mean, it's outrageous the Gibbs free energy, like in terms of thermodynamics, all comes out, right? So basically the Schrodinger's equation, the Heisenberg equation, everything. But basically the reason we've been missing this part is because we've never actually put the source of energy at the center of the system. The source is what we think of as the Schwarzschild solution in terms of energy to that system, that is the black hole nature, the fractal nature of the system, that's where it gets its energy. And we tried to go around the problem in quantum theory where we, we said, well, it's spinning, but it's not really spinning because if it was, it would be radiating all its energy and it would crash and it wouldn't, right? Well, when you put the, sor <laughs> when you put the source in, you can stop playing all these games and trying to go around the problem. And all of a sudden, you know, all of the mechanics of it all works out. You realize, oh, there's a source of energy that's really, really high energy in the system. And 
I'm only measuring what's being screened. And that is the holographic uh, mass solution. That is the volume energy is huge and it's screened by what's on the surface. And what you measure on the outside then is only the, the residual that's able to escape. And out of it, you, when you start thinking about it this way, then you get all the forces and all this comes out as well because the screening, you know, it gives you the right curves to describe, you know, the loss of energy of the strong force and all this stuff. So um, this is, uh, yeah, I'm really giving you a lot of like preemptive <laughs> stuff from the paper. Um, <laughs> But um, <laughs> let's just say that in the next few months, it will all get clarified. In words, what I just said is correct based on these equations that we just finished. And um, it, um, it's beautiful. All of a sudden it just comes together and it's really, really beautiful. All the way down to like figuring out the you know, the, the scattering index of, uh, of photons, you know, and, and so on. I mean, it's just, it's just remarkable. And, uh, and it's, it's really amazing because all of a sudden you realize, wow, we're, we have a source of energy that's incredibly strong and we know it's there. It's just all confusing the standard model. Right, like for instance, they can't figure out this the spin problem they call it. Um, they can't figure out the mass problem. I mean, they can't because they're missing the the fundamental. Like for instance, you know, the quarks and the Higgs mechanism only makes up like one to four percent on the max of the mass of the proton. The rest they have to extract from the strong force right from the energy of the of the force but then they don't tell you where the force came from this is one of the confusion that was happening when i published my first papers on this uh, called the sword child proton uh, you know like most scientists don't most physicists don't even know don't realize that the mass of the proton is not present in terms of mass it's present in terms of energy of the force, right? <laughs> which is which has no source in their in their models, right? Like it's, it's just magical, and so you know they call it the spin crisis and so on. But you know it all really comes together when you put the source in, and and all of a sudden, you know, and we have the equations for the source. It just happens that they're cosmological equation you know the sword child solution right the black hole solutions right the the curvature of space time um and and usually those are not applied at the quantum level just like quantum equation are usually not applied at the cosmological level until they start to apply quantum information equation on like you know, quantum cosmology on black holes, and then they got the holographic solution or the holographic principle, right? Which was their approach and, and start finding, oh, wow, it applies. You know, I, before that, I remember I used to be laughed at in physics conference when I would say that quantum effects are not considered at the cosmological level. And they would look at me like, of course, this, there's no quantum effect at the cosmological level. It's it's a different scale, and it's like well, but big things are made out of small things. So you know, like <laughs> so, yeah. But but it, it's all coming together now. It's starting to make amazing. I mean, I mean, it's remarkable. It's no wonder there is no uh, solution to. Quantum gravity, quantum gravity, no unification. No unification. Of course. If, you're, if you're not considering the equations you're applying at the cosmological scale 
at the quantum, quantum scale, scale or vice versa, versa how are you how ever going to unify? unify it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's no way you're going to do it. And then if you have a confining force at the quantum scale and you've invented a whole formalism to account for it, right? And that formalism is not compatible with cosmological equation for confinement, which is gravity, then of course it's not gonna work out. But we found how to make it work out. And basically you just gotta add the source. And then when you add the source, then it, oh, you know, then it makes sense. But then you have to scrap a good portion of quantum theory. I mean, you don't really scrap it. You can, you can demonstrate that it links to it. You can talk about it that way, but it's way more complex than it needs to be. You can talk about it in more simple terms, like, um, like gravito electromagnetics, right? And when you do, then you can scrap as well a good portion of Einstein general relativity because you don't need to talk. You can connect to it that way. You can do tensor equations and, you know, uh, complex uh, tensor equations and, and matrices, but <laughs> you don't necessarily need to talk about it that way neither. You can do a mechanical uh, equations fluid dynamic equation, mechanical equations that on one hand gives you Maxwell's electromagnetics and on the other one gives you gravity. And when you do it right, which they're trying to get to, they're actually getting really close. When you do it right, all of a sudden you can scale it from the proton, from the Planck all the way to the universe and it gives you the right answers with one formalism that actually kind of scrap both, you know, QCD, QED, and a good portion of general relativity because, and, and connects with special relativity really nicely so that like all of a sudden the whole thing is unified and, um, and you can get all the right answers with, without doing like crazy mathematics or having, you know, unsolvable equations like third derivatives and stuff that like nobody can solve, right? Or, or that like you have to do Monte Carlo, you know, you know, like, um, uh, you know, computations on, you, you, all of a sudden you get analytical solutions to all the different scales. And it's very, very, very powerful. It's very powerful. And the application to technology is very, very powerful. It's very exciting. That's actually uh, one of the questions we were exploring right as you came in was, was taking that concept. Okay, so there's a source. There's this energy that permeates all of space. And it's not a trivial amount of energy. It's a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, like, like really, really large amount of energy uh, to, to free space. Um, so one of the questions we were exploring is, uh, so what do you think is the most important step for us to attain free energy vehicles and devices? And uh, I was just pointing out, since I don't know the answer to that question at all, <laughs> I was just pointing out that, well, the first step is that you've got to realize that there is this tremendous amount of energy that mm -hmm. permeates all of the universe, that that. that the free space has a, a very high energy density. So the energy is there, you know, so th that's the first step. You've got to come to that realization. And then as you're showing, the physics works out. And right. then you can start doing Then you the, got the roadmap. The roadmap to, to get the technology. Right, exactly. Because now you know how it works. So now you know what you got to do to reproduce it, to tap into it. Um, that's like the critical part. That's why I've done experiments for 20 years, but at the same time, in parallel, I've been doing physics because <coughs> the physics are required. And, um, and, but although, you know, by deduction and some instinctive notion, you might get to, to devices that work. Uh, but if the physics are not with it, then it's really hard to get them into the world because then people say it's not possible, you know, all this stuff. 
But if you have the physics to demonstrate it, then the world can do a, a very strong effort to get there very quickly um, because it's the straight roadmap. And, you know, I was thinking about it more in your field, William, you know, and Ines as well, because I know she's interested since she's doing all these consciousness experiments over there in Mexico. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you know I, it makes me think of you know, if I want to translate it to my being, right? It makes me think like a person has like this ultimate source, right? Of consciousness, like their 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 super self, you know, where they're weak, they're wearing a cape and they're like superwoman, superman, you know, like they're like Ta, 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 you know, like, you know, they're the master of all masters. They, they're all, you know, like when, when a baby comes out, it comes out like that, right? Somewhat. But then, you know, there's this, um, there, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of screening. There's a certain amount of disorder, right? There's a certain amount of veils, you know, that are like, so, so, the access to this like ultimate you know source is like a very specific path you know meaning there's very specific things you got to do to get past the screening and to get into that ultimate state right and, uh, and if you know those techniques and if you know those tools you can get there right but uh, but you have to make the effort you have to like you said, you first have to know that there's a superhero in you, right? You, you have to know it's there because otherwise you're just in the screening, you're just in the noise and it's like, okay, there's some energy, but it's a little bit decoherent and there's not that much, right? So, so but then when you know it's there, then you, then there's, then you have to know the mechanics on how to like get past the screening and, uh, and, and, um, and so, so it's not even just in the technology, it's even in the way, like basically we're on the entropic side of the event horizon where we're, we're on the side in which things tend to go to decoherency and tends to go, you know, like there's a lot of thermodynamics, like there's a lot of, you know, diffusion of energy, right? And we have to get back to the source where actually it's negentropic on that side, right? It's negentropic. And on that side, that's the creative side that creates organization and coherency, both in our consciousness and in our technology. It's so, so awesome that the, 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 the same, same principles, principles that can be, that can be applied, applied. Oh, I've got an echo going. Uh, the same principles that can be applied for uh, generating the technology, they apply nearly directly to personal uh, growth. Uh, you can attain the, nearly the exact same principles to achieve that maximum coherent state, that uh, uh, superhero state uh, in yourself. It's really, uh, I think, uh, a profound equivalence there. And um, I, I think so, something that uh, is just as important as the technology and theoretical side of the understanding is how to apply it personally to bring yourself into that, um, that, that super conducting, uh, su su super efficient state of your being. I guess that would also connect with the fact that if we um, understand it deeply, deeply enough, we could become the technology itself, like a consciousness technology. We could go directly to that in if we, we reach that state, which would be amazing. Absolutely. And I, I think that many masters across the ages have done that. Um, and they were, I think in some ways, you know, precursor to the technology, I think you have to definitely do a certain amount of that before your society 
reach those levels of technology because you got to come up with the, the math and the physics, right? Because you need that for the technology. So, you know, it really is an amazing thing. It's like the universe is fail safe. If a civilization doesn't reach, but there's, it's, it's on a time scale though. If a society doesn't reach that level of awareness on time, then they run out of resources, right? On their planet, there's overpopulation, all kinds of problems happen. And you and that society, or there's a meteorite that comes too close, or there's a sun flare, or whatever, you know, they get wiped out, recycled, you know, they recycle, the universe recycle all the atoms. They don't go anywhere, they just, you know, disorganize and reorganize. Just right? try again, yeah. <laughs> try again later. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So hopefully we make it on this cycle. I'd like that. I, I really don't want to do another one of these. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think, you know, we're, um, I think we're close. I, I, I'm really, really excited. I'm really excited about the transformation that's arriving on the planet. At the same time, I really am concerned about the state of health of our society, um, you know, and, and, and I'm really grateful for all the people that are dedicating their life, whether they know it or not, for the evolution of humanity. Because I think society is awakening to what has been shielded from them, screened from them, right? In many ways, not just their superhero phase inside of them, but in society, things have been screened from them and it's becoming exposed. And I'm gonna leave it at that because I could start raging because, <laughs> because, because I'm really upset about what they're doing to children right now and under the auspices of keeping them safe which in this case and I'm not going to give details I'm not going to say names or words that will get us banned but um, in this case something that is actually have zero impact on the young population they're quite fine you know <laughs> And they certainly don't need to be given any, I'm just going to say it, in the general sense, any treatments are unnecessary for the young population <laughs> and most likely is, can have significant, you know, significant, which is coming out now, significant negative impact. So, you know, significant, okay? Just, just saying. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Otherwise, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rage. And, uh, and I do science, and, and so do you guys, William and, and Ines, and, and, and we're talking to Nobel Prize winner scientists. You know, we're, it's not in the realm of pseudoscience or anything like that. It's. It's not a bunch of people, you know, with political agenda. It's, it's people doing good science and, you know, taking the facts and mm, coming to conclusions, right? So just saying. Yeah, because you can, because there's like also this like prejudice and like, oh, mainstream is all bad and they don't understand and all of that. But we have to understand that there's a huge mis misleading uh, leadership. I mean, it's the leadership which we question. It's that part because right. it's not organic. Where did it come from? Where did the, the the religions came from? I mean, was that organic? Is that raised from the basis? I mean, for sure, it, it was not the case. So that's right. what we have been always misled, and right. it's like, and it's like okay, let's get over with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's go to the source to yeah. everything. Yeah, go, yeah. That, that image of the source remind me of the salmons going, you know, against the flow of the river to go to the source of the river. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> <Let's be> salmons. <laughs> yeah, 
in turbulence you end up at the source that's a great video um it's a sad experiment because a fish dies but you know it, it's an it's a really amazing thing i think you can find it on youtube you know if you put the object in the current of a of a river or a current like a laminar flow of of water and it produced turbulence and then you take a freshly dead trout or fish, you know, and it, it's got to be supple still, right? It can't be that it was dead for three days, right? Or, and frozen. And so, and, and you put it in it, uh, the fish, first of all, it looks completely alive, right? But it will swim up the current to the oh. object because of the turbulence, because of the spin, that is in the laminar flow and um and really this is you know this is this is what we're doing we're swimming up current and uh finding the source at all levels so i'm you know everybody we're in a really good place i'm very encouraged people have to be patient you have to be patient with yourself you have to be patient with the world everybody's learning even the ones that you might think are not so great right <laughs> um they're as well stuck in gears that have been put in by others long before them and all this you know everybody's stuck in these gears it's just that now we were like finding which are the gears that are not working and that are that needs to be removed and uh or modified and 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 that's a really really exciting thing really really exciting so should we take some questions uh, yeah and so um some of our top questions uh they're, they're uh really focusing on the technology application aspect of this research yeah um one of them um, from Barbara Andrew uh, is discussing what was presented in uh, Thrive 2. Um, and they were asking, um, I wondered about the technology you discussed in the movie and that uh, you were still waiting for some results from that. Um, and uh, th then also we, we were still kind of in the middle of uh, discussing with uh, Christiana Altrian, yeah. um, about uh, what do you think is the most important step for us to attain free energy vehicles and devices? And I think that's a good one uh, to, to approach it from and discuss it because, you, you know, um, we, we can kind of lay a more general foundation for what needs to be done to get to, you know, um, uh, uh, utilizing this, this free energy that, that is the field. Yeah, um, so so there's two parts to the question. What was the first part? <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, so um, the first part was uh, the move, the, the uh, technology that you discussed in Thrive 2. Oh, right. Uh, oh, so, so yeah, so, well, I that wasn't my section, right? Uh, oh, the technology in, in our laboratories. Well, a lot of things are moving forward. It's very exciting. And you know, I would say that um, I know I've been saying this for a while, but it's on its way. Um, you know, um, the art crystal is, you know, might look, um, you know, trivial, but it really is a first step. But um, there is amazing technology that's following through and we're in the middle of doing um a lot of really important research, but as well, I've been concentrating mostly on uh, theoretical uh, sections because that needs to be finished and that's taken a lot of my time. But there is advancements that are happening on the technological level that's really, really happening. And like, what is it gonna take? It's gonna take the world population to endorse the uh, their research efforts at the deepest level, 
you know, it, and, and not like in their consciousness, but first of all, realizing, oh, there is a source, you know, like you were saying earlier, oh, we, <laughs> there is a source. And then, oh, how do we access it? Oh, well, we need the scientists to be well-funded. We need good efforts. We need international efforts. We need, you know, we can get there. I swear to you guys, I swear we can get there. Okay, like I wouldn't say this lightly, you know, I, I really wouldn't. People, I, you know, like, it, first of all, I know because it's, I've seen it, but I as well, you know, I, I know because it's clearly happening everywhere in the universe. It, they're called atoms, you know, they, they're called protons, they're called, right? So it's clearly happening. We just got to like figure out the mechanics of it and then apply it. And we have now the theoretical tenets, but, and, and it, the economical, like the, the financial structures and the political structure have to endorse it and, and go, you know, and, you know, I was thinking about that driving yesterday and I was thinking, wow, you know, how many years was I told that, you know, and many others that, you know, it was like UFOs were not real and that like I was insane for thinking that such things existed and if they did, they probably couldn't get to Earth because they were too far from Earth and all this stuff. And, like, and now, you know, it's like all of a sudden, because a few documents leaked out of the Pentagon and then eventually the Pentagon admitted to them and then eventually the media, the mainstream media picked up on it. Now it's like very serious. I mean, it's very, very serious. The, 60 Minutes did a great episode on it. And, you know, the, it's been talked on five o'clock news, you know, what's going on in our skies and all this. And the pilots that were there are clearly saying, you know, from what they were doing, <laughs> there is no way this is, you know, some other country technology or ours or anything like that. Um, so, this is so you know how many so 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 clearly these people figured it out right whoever they are <laughs> clearly they figured it out and and clearly <laughs> their civilization made it past this point right because clearly they can get off the surface of their planet at ease since they can come to ours and get off at these, they don't need thousands of tons of fuel. They don't need, they don't need like, you know, to burn massive amount of stuff. And, you know, so clearly it's doable. So he, he, let's just say just that, just, just that it's doable. Right. Um, now, does is it a thousand years from now? I don't think so, right? Clearly, what they figured at least one thing they figured is how gravity works and how to play with gravity, how to alter gravity so that it works. So, so, so open your mind, right? Like, you know, just like. It was hard for people to imagine when I used to start to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrial life. I remember in the 90s and the 2000, early 2000, it was like my audience, my audience would shut off. Right. I could feel the energy change. It's like it was too much. Right. But now it's starting to like people are starting so it's, it's all of us that's going to bring this into the world. But we have to ourselves be capable of doing, of going there. We have to see that in our future. And then we have to take actions to support that in our future, right? 
And, you know, like I was reading stuff on the Chinese tokabacks this morning. You guys are on the research thread with us, so you know. And, you know, it's just billions of dollars into hot fusion devices that have not produced one watt of usable energy, you know. And it's like, meanwhile, you know, so-called cold fusion has been there all along and so on. And of course, cold fusion is not necessarily the solution neither, but it was definitely showing experimental studies have shown definite anomalies. They, they're hard to reproduce and they can be erratic and all this, but, but that's how science works is you find this little, you know, thing that doesn't work, you know, it's like, and that, that doesn't fit your model. And then you, it might be a really small effect, but then you realize, oh, wait, that's telling me something different about the universe. And then you exploit that. And then you realize, oh my God, it's a huge effect, right? It's so, but, but, but it's like, you just poke through the screening to the source for a second, right? And then, and then you fall back in the screening and you're like, ah, how did I get back to it, right? But then eventually you figure out the mechanics on how to hap that happens. But like, yeah, I mean, the main thing is that people banned, you know, to, we, we need a movement, you know, to bring it forward and we need the institution to make the efforts. And we need the scientists to write the papers and the physics, and that's why we're doing it. And so, you know, I'm happy to announce that we have now 100,000 people taking the unified science course at the Resident Science Foundation. We've, we've crossed, I've been saying we're close to 100,000 for a few months. Now we're past 100,000, so it's really exciting. And so that is a pretty strong community, folks. And that's because people are interested and people know there's got to be more. And when they read the, um, the course, they realize, wow, you know, that kind of works. It's coherent. And they talk to their friends about it and their friends take the course. And they go, oh, yeah, that's coherent. That works. And so on. And we're about with the help of Ines and William and um, and Marshall and Jamie and all this, but Ines did the bulk of the work. Uh, we're about to publish module seven. So that's gonna treat all of the papers that were published since module six was written. So the electron paper, the vacuum catastrophe paper and cosmology, and um, and so on, and so that's gonna like kind of fill in, fill in what you need for module eight that's gonna come out like a few months later, which gonna ex explain everything that's in the new paper, and that's gonna be so sweet, so sweet. That is gonna be so sweet. <laughs> I swear, you, it's gonna make people cry. I I. I, it's already made many scientists cry so far, Ines being one of them. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And, oh my and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and, and our attorneys, and, uh, you know, that are technical attorneys. And, and, so, on. and, and so it, it really, it's really an amazing thing. Um, and, and, and we're going to make our best, you know, it's a few hundred, yeah, it's, it's a few, like maybe, I don't know how many equations, but you know, it's a lot of equations, but I'm going to make some videos with Ines and Olivier and William and all this to explain all this in really clear terms, because everybody can understand it. It's really, really straightforward. It's really, really straightforward. And we started to explain it earlier on. So yeah. it is amazing because it's like everything was kind of there, but not exactly there. It was like confusing. And now it's so clear. It's so clear. It's like, oh my God. And it was just, 
a little piece, you know, holographic solution and so uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. It was like a little poke into yeah. the source and then, oh, and then this piece, this piece, this piece, and then wow, it all flowered. Yes, I kind of had the same ex uh, experience because when talking uh, in, at the beginning of this uh, Q and A, um, it was the zero Wigan effect. It was as well the same thing, you know. No one paid attention to that, and it was like zero Wigan. And it was what's that? And so let's, and the, oh my god, and look at, and oh my god, and look at all, all these people behind, like saying, please pay attention to the fucking zero Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> No. The problem is that nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I would say that's part of the problem. Yeah. I'm not gonna even try. I'm just saying I, I just call it the Z effect. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, all the people and all these physicists that have been uh, you know discussing with, with us in, in this uh, subject uh, about this topic, it was amazing because they would all say, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. How can how can it be that we that this is something so important and no one talks about it? And there have been models that are so close to what you're doing, and it's it's like no, no way. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, because you know that's part of a, of a screening that is good in on our side. You know, they, they this screening has helped us as well a little bit. I think. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, luckily things happen at the right time you know you just have to trust that things happen at the right time when the right when people are ready and you you don't know what's going to make people ready you know look at what happened in the last year and a half which is horrendous in some ways right i mean of course i have you know my heart is with all the people that suffered my mom passed, you know, f from all this and all, and then, and at the same time, the change it has produced in society is remarkable. Like the positive change, meaning the, you know, the opening and the eyes opening that's happening right now. And in, in all, walks of life, but as well in the scientific community, you know, and that's what we got to keep our eyes on. We have to keep our eyes on this, like, you know, you have people at very high level of, of government and industry and so on talking about things that you never thought would come out of their mouth, right? And, it, and it's like, wow, yeah. you know, it really is transforming and it's beautiful to see and it's difficult at the same time. But what transformation, you know, that's the whole thing with the, the screening, the random part, right? The Fermi noise and, and the, Bose, the Bose Einstein thing is that, you know, it has to break up somewhere so that it can reform like in a higher state somewhere else. Right. So you have to, you have to go through that part. You got to go through the, the phase transition, you know, that feels like everything's falling apart and everything's difficult and all this. And, and don't think for a minute that you're separated from it no matter where you go on the planet, meaning you can go and like isolate yourself in a cave in the middle of the Himalayas. And, you know, maybe you won't be confronted every day with the five o'clock news and all the insanity or whatever, but like, but you'll feel it. You'll feel it. And you're, you know, so many people these days say, I'm so depressed. I'm so, you know, it's so hard for me to get out of bed. Like, I feel it too, like, oh my God, like I wake up some morning and I'm thinking, I'm like having the worst thoughts and I'm thinking, where did that come from, right? Because it's in the morphogenetic field. So you got to push through it these days. And it's really important. You know, it's really important. Some of the people don't have the tools to be able to push through it. And it's, 
It's horrifying. And it, and it's dramatic. And some of these people are 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 are, are young population, like you know, they're like suffering because they they don't see the the whole purpose of the thing, right? They don't they don't have the vision that, and we can give that to them. It's there, you know, but you know, we have to get it out. And that's why it's so um it's so exciting that we're at a hundred thousand people and you know now let's go for two hundred thousand let's go for a million you know like let's go let let's go and like with module seven module eight and especially with module eight we're gonna get there and and we're gonna make this change uh, all together we're all gonna make this change and every single one of you guys listening today and everyone that's taking the course and everyone that's helping us and all this, like every single one is important. Like every single one, whether they know about us or not, you know, any single person on the planet that's getting past the screening, right? at all levels, whether you're the screening to their own superhero or the screening of the confusion that's going on in society right now and getting to the source and all this, every single one makes a huge difference. Huge difference. There's a question here that maybe it's linked to what we have, we're, we have been saying. It's Simon K3 again. And it says, is, if gravity is a self-organizing vortex in the vacuum, as I learned from Unisim, <laughs> if I got that correct, then he said, then if consciousness is the medium in which we experience reality or self-awareness that is natural arising within any sufficiently integrated feedback network, is or can our consciousness if, if affect gravity itself, organizing vortex, or does gravity operate in a different scale and not affected by consciousness? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I I would say that definitely consciousness can affect gravity. Um, it it I think the effect might be really slight. So most of the time we don't measure it, we don't see it, we don't exactly, you know. Um, but um, it really is um, possible. Hi, Simon. Oh, yes. I ah, there's my mic. Say we. Je pas pensé un peu. But, uh, yeah. How are you doing? Well. I love that. I remember you. I love that thing behind you. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a design for uh, light and um, light and sound in a house design. Uh, working uh -huh. with Native Americans that we spoke to but my mic wasn't working well last time so. my uh, it looks like the it looks like the plonk fermi uh bose einstein condensate type of thing it's like uh wow uh, you know it looks like the plonk field uh organizing itself in larger and larger bubbles but um yeah i mean that's a good point and is that true? Well, okay, so I'm going to have to go heuristic on you because we don't have good measurements. I uh, see. Uh, but uh, definitely heuristically. So I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't experience it myself. So I'm just going to like put that out just so we're clear. Right? I'm just going to put that out. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for it, but I'm just <laughs> going to put it out. Um, the, the, there's many people around the world. Most of the time, people have spent a lot of time meditating, that have spent a lot of time contemplating and all this, that have reported experiences of levitation. You know, there's definitely one famous dude from about 2,000 years ago that seemed to have been... <clears throat> Yeah. I seem to have been able to do that. Um, but either than that guy, um, there was others. Um, and, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, I'm just going to say it. 
uh, I experienced that when I was in my van from um, like the year in the late years of the 90s. Uh, and one of those instances, and in both cases, I didn't do it on purpose, but one of those instances was witnessed by a third party, meaning I was not on the ground. I was sleeping, but I was just not on the ground. And so um, this, um, this, I believe is possible. Um, and it should be, you know, a direct consequence. And, you know, with William Brown, we're in the middle of writing the, you know, from the physics that we're writing on gravity and electromagnetism, we have direct means to connect directly to biology. We found the link, right? So we're in the middle of doing that. So eventually we should even have an equation that tells you how much data uh, mm. self-organizing vortex dynamic has to happen. What's the energy level that has to happen? Like for instance, in your mitochondria and into your, you know, um, ATP production and all this for you to start, you know, literally, you know, producing gravitational effects. But, mm. but I can't give you that equation right now. So it's heuristic uh, in my answer, but I assure you it comes from direct experience and from the physics I'm writing. And that's well, the thing is, is that right? related to what I, oh, sorry, William. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just gonna add that, uh, you know, within the biology, uh, a lot of the ordering dynamics that are taking place is interaction of the micromolecules with that field. Uh, so, I mean, it's on a very small scale, right? But uh, it, it is working with essentially the, the, the force of gravity. Um, uh, you know, th this is even evident in like uh, the uh, OR uh, orchestrated objective reduction model of Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff, um, you, you know, so like at an extremely small scale, albeit with billions and billions of, of reactions in the biological system, there are all these minute, uh, you can almost think of them as, as uh, uh, quantum computations that are involving that uh, gravitational field, essentially. Uh, and, and so, you know, I could easily envision a case scenario where, you know, the all of those are summed together in a coherent way. And you have like a large scale uh, 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 change in, in the gravitational vortex. And you could see probably some pretty large macroscopic effects from that. Right, mm. right. But it's not practical. You see, that's, that, that, that is the, the thing that, um, you know, that I've had to fight, you know, so much I had to like, you know, ha I had some difficulties with the mainstream scientific community at certain times. Um, uh, you know, time. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting better. It's getting much better. I, I, we're we're past that. I, we're I mean I we're the mainstream now. But uh, the the on the other side with the with the spiritual community, I've had a lot of that. Um, resistance as well because the tendency is to say but we don't need any technology we just need us right like we we don't like no, we don't need no stinking technology I, I used to get phone calls of people that were irate with me because they were saying you have so much knowledge and you need to you, you have a responsibility to guide people properly and you, you're talking about technology like we don't need more technology we need people to understand better and all this and it's like, it's true. But then I was saying, but you're telling me this on your cell phone while driving your car, right? Like, dude, you know, it, it, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's, it's like, yeah, of course, consciousness is the source of the technology because it, we build it, right? But, but the technology, right? It's, oh, great. Everybody goes into a cave for a hundred years and learn to levitate. Great. Now what do we do? We levitate ourselves to work. What, we, like, if you levitate, you know, if you levitate outside the atmosphere, now you can't breathe. So now you, you know, like, oh, you got a problem, right? So, <coughs> so cl 
technology is just an extension of our level of awareness of consciousness you know is is the beauty of of this amazing universe is that it can replicate and it can replicate outside itself meaning you can replicate your higher knowledge into something outside yourself that reproduce the same dynamics uh it's just that so far we've replicated this level of awareness that's not so advanced right so the technology is a little bit clunky and a little bit destructive right but yeah. but that that's just one step in the evolution of a society right and then you can have technology. One of you what you're saying and what uh, learned from william in terms of the mitochondria moving at like 8000 rpms and and uh einstein's quote of physical objects are not not um that are an extension of space so it's and and i guess doesn't this have to do then relate to the ability to travel in spacecrafts that are warping gravity then that our consciousness is warping is working with it i mean you're answering that in a, I, I can't find the words to express what I'm saying, but it seems to be indirectly answering or speaking to that aspect, right? In terms of these crafts that that when you move, everything is moving with gravity. So there's no, uh, what do you call it? Acceleration or you don't feel that acceleration, which was right. another question I had last time that you sort of touched on earlier when you came on talking about gravitational mass versus inertial mass. Right. You know, Differences. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the, I'm going to give you, and this is for humanity. So, like, just humanity, please listen. Uh, <laughs> the key to warping space time. Okay. You ready for it? Yes. Okay. The key is that space time is already warped in every point, everywhere. That's, that's, that's the source. It's spinning. <laughs> It's yeah, spin. everything goes to singularity everywhere, right? It's everywhere. already warped. It's connected. So it's already there. You just got to enter, you know, the the nature of it, right? You, I'm sorry. That's my phone. Um, <laughs> it, it, and it's FaceTime face time warping. <laughs> yeah. So you, you just have to connect with it, like the net into the network, and then it will you know, then you have access, right? Mm -hmm. And so let me, let me shut off the phone. Mm -hmm. All right, it shut off on its own. Okay, so, um, so this is, uh, this is really, uh, uh, this is really important, meaning you only have to figure out the mechanics, right? So for instance, oh, and by the way, on the mitochondria, from yeah. the later research we've done, we found that actually when it's in high energy state, mitochondria can spin at 60,000 RPM. Wow. Right? wow. Yeah. So that, that, those, are, those are really good motors and there's like millions of them, right? right. And so, um, so this, is, uh, this is almost, this is much more, so to, to understand is that you, you, you just got to get into the mouth of the vortex, meaning okay. it's already warped, right? You just yeah. got to link into the, to, the, to the network and then you can go wherever you want. You can do whatever you want, but you got to link into the network. You can't be on the screening side of it, right? You got to be on the warp side of it. Uh, on the screening side of it, it doesn't appear like it's warped, yeah. right? Because you can't see it. Yeah, you look around. Yeah, yeah. You're uh, you're you're you're, on, you're in the noise, right? But but at the same time as you're in the noise, right? You're on a planet that's going thousands of miles per minute through space. You're you know that's in a solar system that's going thousands of kilometer you know miles per second in space that's on in a galaxy that's orbiting a huge black hole that's going like thousands and thousands, you know and then i keep adding that you'll find that you know you're already warped right you're, you're already moving at the speed of light 
you're moving at past the speed of light. You, yeah. you know, it, you're instantaneously everywhere. You're already warped because you're made of atoms that are singularities that are warping. And so basically, that's you, you know, be, um, becoming aware of that is like, outside of technology, is like you finding your superhero. Oh, I'm warped to infinity already. I'm, you know, that's my, you see, you see what I mean? Yes, yes. It's a good warp. It's not a bad warp. Right? And, uh, and, Thank and, you out. yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. the spaghettification. It's not the spaghettification. No, <laughs> it's not the spaghettification. Um, um, but you could think of the knowledge base of your superhero self as being strings, you know, like spaghetti strings that that connects everywhere um, yeah like wormholes being like you know strings that connects all the protons together that are like vortices you know spinning mm -hmm. in space currents currents in space or or uh, circulation right and um and so really that is the key and then when you realize that, then then you can manufacture the technology to, you know, link into the network, just like your brain is. Clearly, your brain is right. It's yeah. tuned into the network, right? And um, it's quite capable of doing very remarkable non-linear information transfer, like for instance like all the studies that were done at Stanford on remote viewing, you know? So, you know, although that might sound to some scientists that that's heuristic, it's not. That 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 was tested and from one end to the other, you know, they were pulling students off the campus and getting them to remote view with no training, right? Like this is a function that everybody has, right? And all of yeah. a sudden, they, they could give you details of a place they've never been to, you know, on the other side of the world, right? And so how did you get that information? Not in a linear way, right? No. Okay. So, so you see, the information is accessible. That means you're already worked, right? You're already, <laughs> you're already there. And when you make the device that, that logs on to that thing, well, then that device, um, you know, is just like you can think of a place that you've never been to and figure out the information that's there. Well, you can think of a place and all of a sudden you're in that place. Wow. <laughs> right? Because the device is just following the coordinates of, you know, the network, the warp network that you're <laughs> accessing. <laughs> All right, and that's really useful. You know, it, it like eliminates you know long commutes and <laughs> to your local <laughs> star system and so on, and you speeding know. tickets and anything like that. <laughs> exactly, and it makes it so that all of a sudden you can have a what they call right now a tic tac event, right, where you have a. a, a an object that's like in one place, one moment, and then it's like 60 miles away within a second, you know, and then they go, and then it reappears, you know, and so on. Like, this is, you know, this is just using the natural structure of space as it is. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it really clarifies that a lot. Um, when I explain and invite people to the, to the foundation and the courses, one of the things, uh, it may be a very naive question, but the difference between weight and mass, because mass is used a lot, and when they're listening to the lectures, is mass have to do, uh, sorry to bore like anybody of the physics that, that are so simple, but mass has to do with, is it acceleration? Um, I'm sorry, uh, weight. Is that the difference? Because everything is measured in mass, the way you guys talk about it. And when I'm trying to get more people in the residence foundation, it's one of the things that come up. And I, I find myself sometimes 
uh, I want some simple answer. I know I can Google it and they can Google it, but it's not the same as the way you got all of you explain it so simply. Right. Um, well, you know, that's the thing. Yeah. Don't worry if you're having a hard time with that because okay. even Einstein was sweating it. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not an answer. It's not an easy answer. Um, oh. People think, oh, you should be able to like define... You see, because that's why Einstein ended up doing an equivalence between, you know, acceleration and mass, you know, which is, you know, inertial mass and all this stuff. But inertia in physics is not defined. Like we're so mass is not is not defined. Wow. Right. So so, of course, you're having a hard time explaining what mass is. Because okay. in standard physics, there is no explanation what mass is. We just know that it's equivalent to energy, right? So if you multiply the mass by the speed of light square, we know it gives you the right answer for the energy of the system, right? So we have that nice equation, but we don't know what mass is. We certainly don't know why C is C, right? Why the speed of light is the speed of light. So that means on the right side of the equation, we have no idea what's going on, right? We just know these values are there. And then we know that if we multiply these two values together, we get a thing that we call energy, which is the capacity to do work, right? It, it's able to do that amount of work. So that's nice, but it doesn't tell you anything about the things you just found an equivalence about. You don't so know. So is your paper going to answer that? Is your paper answer? Absolutely. Answering? Absolutely. Oh, at the most yeah. But at the most profound level, at the most profound level, wow. we, we, up, we output the speed of light exactly. We can show exactly why the speed of light is the speed of light. We output mass directly from fundamental first tenant of mechanics, you know, straightforward. It's very straightforward. And I'm not going to tell you right now because... I'm going to show you the equation when I tell you so that you understand clearly what I mean. But definitely, yeah. Okay. All right. it, you can think of it, uh, it has to do with this elasticity and the surface tension of space time, like mm. of, of that fundamental fluid. You can imagine that there's a certain elasticity, if you'd like, viscosity to it. And when you calculate that, oops, oh, you find the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. mm. and so you know that really is really uh and it's from first tenant meaning it's not like it's not an artifact of a bunch of free parameters right it's from the fundamental principles mm -hmm. so um mm. so so, so yes, of course you struggle when you try to explain math. And this was, this was one of the biggest problem in relation to weight, because, you know, this was a big problem when I published a sword child proton, because they're saying he's insane. He's thinking that the proton is the, the mass of a mountain. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. it, and it's like, no, I didn't say such thing. I just said that there's an equivalence to the energy of the strong force, right? So clearly it can't be a coincidence that if you consider the energy of the strong force and you put it with the mass, the proton, you end up with exactly the Schwarzschild solution. That is, you end up with the solution of a black hole, exactly, not approximately, for that, that entity. Mm. I was just pointing out that that, cannot be a coincidence so that like we don't understand mass very well which is the fact but you see that's the thing is that these are level of physics that most physicists don't necessarily understand you, mm. they don't think about it right they use mass in their equation constantly they use energy in their equation they don't think about like what is this i'm using right Did it, it's not the only a very few scientists well more now because yeah, i heard you speak about that yeah and point that out which is which is phenomenal is this what you were pointing to when you talk about einstein having photographs of him riding a bicycle and that is it touching on this aspect of weight mass inertia like exactly. I, was, I was blown away when you said that in one of your 
one of these sessions uh, a few months ago. Yeah. Right, because Einstein was trying to figure out what keeps an, um, a bicycle up. It seems not so obvious. obvious. But it's not. It's not. It's wow. not. Gyroscopic effects are not obvious. Like even the Faraday motor is not obvious to explain these issues with the frame of reference. Why, how does the thing know to like, what is the frame of reference that the, that the gyroscope is relating to, right? Uh, they call Mach's principle. Uh, this, you know, it's complex, but basically there's a problem of frame of reference, which would is have mostly to do with ignored. Would it have to do with consciousness somehow? The energy of consciousness, in terms well, of that, staying well, back. Well, the the problem is that when you say consciousness, it's like now you've added C to it, or uh, we'll call it C sub O to the equation, so to differentiate it from the speed of light. So I'm gonna call it C sub O, right? Okay. So if you add C sub O to the equation, now you you have another value that you don't know where it came from, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it complicates it actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's a free parameter. You say, oh, it's consciousness. Wow, okay, but what is that, right? <laughs> you know, so, you know, the, 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 the problem with the frame of reference and, and most physicists, very, very good physicists don't know this problem exists. Most, this is why even Einstein couldn't push it through, he couldn't, get people to understand no there's a problem of a frame of reference here right like it's this, this is this is this is a huge issue like we you know for instance there is um there is uh effects like a in which you um you have a faraday motor it's like a Faraday generator, right? These are like things that we invented hundreds of years ago, right? A hundred and some years ago. And, it, and everybody thinks we understand these things. Of course, we understand magnetic motors. Of course, we understand, you know, Faraday motors, right? They're the most basic motors, right? You have an electrode, <laughs> you have a cathode, and you know, you put a car and the things start going around. Okay, that's cool. Now, now write me a complete, not like a partial, like a complete fundamental first tenant explanation on how that works. No go. And people don't know that. They don't realize that because there's a frame of reference problem. For instance, you can take two magnets, stick them on a copper plate, right? On a copper disc, right? and then spin the whole thing together. There's no differential motion, okay? You just spin the whole thing together. No differential motion. And all of a sudden, and then you put an electrode on the copper disc and an electrode on the, on the shaft, right? That's holding the assembly and you get current, significant amount of current. <laughs> What? Where's the stator, right? What's the frame of reference? Like, how is this thing producing power? Like, mitochondria, mitochondria. <laughs> you're, you're just spinning. I see two magnets, you know, and a disc. Like, what the heck, right? So, uh, <clears throat> you know, and. This partial explanation, mathematics, they'll kind of does the job, but it kind of doesn't, <laughs> you know, it really kind of doesn't. And, um, and that's not well understood. You know, there's another effect that's discovered more recently that like, if you spin a magnet, right? You spin a magnet fairly fast, but not that fast, like with the, with the Dremel, right? And you approach another magnet with it, no matter the, the orientation of the other magnet, you will capture it in a magnetic bubble. Mm. Even if it's in repel or in a track. And you can lift the magnet 
and move it around the space, the magnet is captured. Okay. And so these things, they have to do with angular momentum and gyroscopic effect and all this. And so basically to give you the key to the whole thing is that when you're spinning the two magnets with the disc or whatever you're doing that has to do with spin, when you're doing it, you're, there is a frame of reference and that's the warpage of space time. Like all frames in all universes are relative to what you're doing. Mm. You see, it's, it's, it's not an isolated system. It's never an isolated system. It's always in relationship to the whole. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're measuring as like a current or whatever you're measuring, like energy you're measuring, is just the relationship of that thing to the rest. Mm. You see? Mm -hmm. Depending on this relationship of that thing to the rest, it has a certain energy level that you're measuring locally. Mm. And you're thinking that it's only your local behavior that's producing that energy. No, <laughs> it's, it's non-local. <laughs> it's uh -huh. never local. The local effect is always a result of the non-local relationships. You don't have a choice. The whole thing is warped. <laughs> <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, you brought everything for me and others, I'm sure, together in that sense, yeah. In the terms of consciousness, I could tell you the same thing in terms of consciousness. The mm. non-local effect is the small voice in your head. Mm. Meaning that what you're looking, what you're doing locally is always in a frame of reference of a non-local observer, right? Right. Because, you know, sometimes, often you, you see yourself doing something locally, but you're looking at it from an external perspective as an observer thinking, wow, I'm really screwing up right now. Yeah. Or, I'm, you know, yeah. you know, or, yeah. who is that guy that's talking in the background, right? Yeah. That's, that's your non-local self. That's your superhero, right? Do you see yeah. what I mean? Yes. Same yeah. thing. Same thing. And maybe that Einstein wasn't thinking that far or that deep when he was riding the bicycle, but he was definitely trying to figure out what the hell is keeping that bicycle up? Because yeah. it's not obvious. So you think we have all that worked out, but it's yeah. not completely worked out. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. I'm also okay. Like I got this too. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. You like it? I love it. Yes. Very much. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You feel the energy of it, huh? I do, and I charge the water. Um, yeah. I feel the energy, and boy, one, some, somebody spoke about it in terms of connectedness. Um, not so much, I think the first time I held it, I felt something, but I don't necessarily feel it. But I definitely get like energy, it chills. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a sense that way. And I charge the water every night, uh, or almost every night, but yeah. That's so, a good thing. That's a good thing, especially for this time in history. Yes. Yeah. Stay healthy, strong, drink good water, you know. That's what I learned from all of you and William and Ness and, and the others. And I, I do my best to share that with others. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to That's see okay. you. Again. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I got to get. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I have Someone asked about the Avogadro, Avogadro number. I just want, was wondering if this is something that uh, could be talked about, but it's, uh, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, you, well, this is your field. You want to talk about? No, not me. <laughs> uh, at least explain what the Avogadro number is. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let me remember that. It's, um, it's, the mole, okay, so in chemistry, when you do chemical reactions, so it, it was found that it, this was happening in a, a certain um, proportions. So uh, chemical reactions, when you read them, they happen in, in, in proportions. So you have the proportions of the, of the reactants and you get proportions of the products. 
And so the, the person that, uh, uh, so it was found, I don't remember the person who found it, well, Avogrado, but there was the, the, the person that established that it was happening in proportions in, um, was, um, so anyway, so the, the, the unit that uses, that you have to use in order to have these reactions written the way it does and explain it, explained as that is the mole. It's, it's a unit of, of chemistry and the mole is, uh, it's exactly the Avogadro number, which is the number of, let's say, atoms or molecules or particles that are uh, that are um, involved in this in, in this, this reaction. Yeah. In this reaction, so and and it's a very large number. It's I don't remember. It's order of magnitude. It's exponential. Blah blah. Very high number. Six uh, so, so, six to uh, the ten to the twenty third. Yeah, I was going to say, William is probably going to pull that out of his hat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and so, but that's from William the point of view. William is a machine, man. He's a machine. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I can say about the avocado number. It's Right. So, yeah, I mean, very quickly, because I got to go, but basically, you know, the the the, the concept is a result of measurements, right? And so it's correct because, I mean, we can find it. We actually outputted it from our equations. That was nice. uh, yeah, so, so it, it, it's just a scaling of the, of the behavior of lower scales, right? So mm -hmm. then it emerges at the higher scales at the chemistry level. Right. And and that's what we're finding, actually, as we're writing this paper, because in chemistry it's kind of loose. Right. Chemistry, you have all kinds of things because they're only doing from experiments. So they don't really let excuse my language. They don't really give a shit if the <laughs> physicists agree with it or, or not. You know, basically they're doing experiments and they say, well, this is the way it's working. So. You know, too bad if you don't like it. But like, you know, they have bond angle, like they have, you know, bonds between electrons. Well, electrons are the same charge. Why aren't they repelling? They shouldn't be bonding. And, you know, but they don't care. Like they just, this is how it works. So you guys figure it out. You know, meanwhile, we're doing chemistry, so we don't care. So these guys are, you know, and I'm being you know, cheeky, but I mean, it's not quite like that. Um, <clears throat> it's just that uh, there is a very fundamental scaling relationship, scaling factors in the universe that goes from the Planck to the universe or from the sub Planck to the multiverse, if you want, whichever scale you want to take anytime you're doing scaling you need three different sets of the scales right to know where you are you need the smaller scale and the higher scale so you, you know you can go from the plunk to the universe and then you know where you are or from you know the proton to the um to the stars and then you know where you are you know whatever you do but mm -hmm. When you do this scaling, then you figure out the scaling factor, which we did. And then when you apply it, then you see, oh, yeah, you know, of course, in a reaction, there would be that many numbers of uh, interaction that would occur. It comes right out of the equation. Oh. So it becomes like it becomes understood. And then you understand things like, you know, the for like when you, you when you look at the forces, uh, in chemistry, then you you understand things like you know a relationship between the strong force and gravity that start to explain as well you know the forces at the molecular level of chemistry okay. as well you know which have to do with the bonds and well. Um, with the Vendelworth's force and so on, all of a sudden, all that becomes unified. And then you, and now you understand chemistry from the perspective of physics, which 
people that are more layman may not may think that's already done, but actually it's not. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's not done. So so all of a sudden it it's all part of the same mechanics, and and that's what I have to say about that. Because I gotta run. But <laughs> thank you so much, you guys, to be patient with me. And I'm definitely gonna try to make myself more available. I wanna do all kinds of stuff. I wanna talk to you guys. And I appreciate all the amazing questions. And thank you so much, everybody, for helping us get to 100,000. Uh, and, um, and, and let's go for the stars. Let's go for the universe. Let's, let's blow this world into the next dimension in a good way. It's, no breaking down, but organizing into an amazing place. And thank you so much, William and Ines, for helping me today. I appreciate your time so much. And everybody at the Resonance Science Foundation and everybody at Taurus Tech, you know, an amazing team. Uh, everybody at ARC, you know, an amazing team, an amazing moment in history with amazing people out there. Appreciate so much all of you and every one of you that's um, seeing through the screening and coming to the source of your amazing self. Much mm -hmm. love to everybody. May the vacuum be with you. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.